Just as I rejig things here, I'll just give a quick introduction to myself. Um, I'm an activist from the Kent area. Um, I've done a lot of things generally off my own back and making a documentary by myself. Yeah, I've done a lot of podcasts and, uh, and short films. Okay, so everybody that's awake, raise your hand and say yes. yes. Good afternoon. And welcome to your 20 minutes to turn the worm entitled Activation Energy. Thoughts on igniting personal and social change. Now, when you heard this title, did you think of this? Or how about this? Now, instead, activation energy is a chemistry term, meaning the minimum energy required to start a chemical reaction. I'm using the psychology definition, which means the motivational force necessary to overcome psychological resistance and take action. So you'll notice this presentation is largely about a phenomenon that occurs inside of only a few seconds. But as we go deeper, you will see why these few seconds are so pivotal to shaping our success. So why is motivation relevant to the task of improving the world? Because everybody wants change, but far fewer people want to change. It's like most people want to be physically and medically fit, but far fewer people want to actually do the exercise and change your nutrition to be in that state of fitness. So say for instance, you're lying in bed in the morning, and it's way too comfy to move. And so you, ne you really need a tea or coffee to get you started for the day, but you cannot be hassled with what's physically necessary to get up and make it. How many of you can empathize? Yeah? You associate a greater degree of discomfort to getting up out of that bed and a greater degree of comfort to staying in that warm bed. So you stay put and go without. Unless you have someone you can barge out of bed to make it for you. It's understandable why there's resistance to the idea of advocating a brand new socio-economic system. It goes against the grain. Human beings find it easier to not only go along with what everyone else is doing, but also what the economic system demands of us in order to survive. And then, once you've fulfilled your economic, ob economic obli ob yeah, obligations for the day, for most people there's barely time let alone inclination, to then put in effort to change the world for the better. So it's a triple whammy of social control. To do something different, especially if it requires you to advocate those differences in communication, it makes you visible. And whilst that is often where most people would back down to preserve their social image, you make yourself even more visible by taking that pressure on yourself of resisting those social value systems and advocate that new approach. It's easy to stay where you are, and it's hard to take action, especially if everyone else around you isn't. This can create strain in your relationships because compared to them, you're going in a different direction. So it's hard to initiate change from a singular standpoint, and it's easy to assume that this burden of change weighs on you like the weight of the world. And you know what? It's easy to see why. There's a massive dead weight in the form of thousands of years of social conditioning for the idea of relinquishing your liberty and thought to others we've deemed more capable of handling it. Or at least who we can rationalise giving said power up to. This disempowers us from the get-go to affect change in a way that matters. So. As a result, it feels like a boulder that you alone are charged with moving up the steep hill. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. See, I saw a lot of muscle in those arms. <laughs> okay, I think collectively, we can move this boulder. As Rami Malek said in Mr. Robot, every day we change the world. But to change the world in a way that means anything, that takes more time than most people have. It never happens all at once. It's slow, it's methodical, it's exhausting. We don't all have the stomach for it. So where does this resistance come from? Impulse control is how we describe this phenomenon. It's the same reason why most people don't enter a pub sober and go, Or at least with confidence, right? 
because they lack the perception of entitlement in that environment to be so visible. Normally, that takes time spent becoming familiar in the environment, gaining social proof, drinking alcohol, or all of the above. Human beings find it easier to actually go along with these kinds of social pressures and with social creatures. And as a result, we're generally inclined to act in a pleasing and non-threatening manner towards the group. The draw to maintain your homeostasis as an organism, meaning your stability and comfort of existence, is often greater than the draw to act in ways that could potentially threaten that homeostasis. Whilst that often acts as a safety guard for our survival, it acts as an inhibitor when we stay in that thought loop. So for instance, you're talking to someone about an NLRBE and or the need for the transition to it, and they suddenly become disinterested. It confuses you why they seem to care so little for something that matters so much. How many of you can empathise with this situation? Raise your hand. The reason why they rejected the train of thought is not because they don't care about a better world, far from it, but because they've given a different meaning to what you've been saying and thus assume that it will be too socially disruptive, too unrealistic and advocating it would make them too visible. This is why being confident and being able to communicate about this is so important because that confidence stands out from other campaigners on the high street that are trying to take value whilst you on the other hand are giving value. As a little thought experiment, would you lack confidence if instead of a flyer you were handing them a check for £10,000? Yes or no? No, of course not. Now, if you're not taking notes by this point, I suggest you start with this one. Write this down. The comfort zone has its own gravitational field. The comfort zone has its own gravitational field. What do I mean by this? Very simple. Prolonged inactivity slows activity. Just like a mechanical machine will start to seize up over time uh, if it's not operated, the human brain and body will atrophy over time with inactivity. We call it being sedentary. Now by a show of hands, who here actually tests the boundaries of their comfort zone on occasion? Wow, that is great to see. You will notice that it takes no effort at all to sink back to the safe and familiar, almost like you're sinking back into your favourite chair or a comfy bed. But you know what? Most people spend the majority of their lives right there staying where it's comfortable and unchallenging. So, repeated experiences of stretching, as it's called, will first acquaint you with how it feels to overcome that initial resistance, and second, it will actually expand your comfort zone. This gives us the momentum we need to keep escaping the gravity well of the comfort zone and out to the stars. In this respect, we're kind of like sharks. To ensure they don't drown, their gill direction and physiology demands their constant forward <laughs> movement. Oh, um, yeah, th this is actually what Peter Joseph originally had in mind for Zygos moving forward, so don't tell anyone. Well, from one colossal beast to another. Four or five moments, that's all it takes to be a hero. What Colossus was referring to there is not only that heroism happens in the crucial moments and not a lifelong chore, but also the time window of opportunity between when you consciously recognise that right action can and should be taken and the point when you either take it or you don't. If your mind has built up a sufficiently high blockade of excuses, then the chances of overcoming them and taking right action, at least with confidence, is less likely. If action is taken inside this window, however, then you are far more likely to overcome the resistance before it grows too high. Think of it like a video game character jumping over a raising wall. As you either approach it, you either jump over it, or you collide with it. The thing is, even if you collide with it, that doesn't mean that scaling the wall is impossible, but it just means you now have a climb instead of a hurdle, and it's easier to rationalise why it's not worth it. So how can we ensure that we can keep scaling these walls by using a very simple principle. Act at such a speed 
but it overwhelms and preempts the thinking mind. Act at such a speed that it overwhelms and preempts the thinking mind. Your brain can actually become an enemy of taking action by automatically generating excuses and reasons not to act. And it can dig its heels in and become like a stubborn horse. So act before it's collected enough dead weight. When you're in the crucial moment, take right action before your brain gives up on the journey. It's never going to feel like the right moment. It's, ne it's always going to feel awkward when you start off. But when you take right action, you can start gaining momentum. Now here we will explore three links in a causal chain of decisions. Focus, meaning and decision. Starting off with focus, if you view the world through the lens of problems and crises, is it any wonder that you start feeling helpless? And even if you were to advocate a better world from that blueprint, then what kind of place is that coming from emotionally? You know, I used to see this one guy on Maidstone High Street whenever I was out on the megaphone or giving free hugs. He'd come up to me and he'd start complaining about these wide array of problems and social problems and, so and conspiracies. And every now and then I would mention about the need to advocate solutions and to move forward. So, who can guess what his reaction to that was? <laughs> Precisely. He'd flat out state that there's no hope to change things for the better and we're deluded if we think otherwise. Now, is it any surprise that that's how he felt? He focused so much on all the problems in the world that he convinced himself of not just his helplessness to change it, but our helplessness as a society to change it. So, how can focus be used for our benefit? Focus can be directed by questions, and the choice of question will yield a corresponding answer. So if in the midst of a barrage of negative experiences, you ask your brain, why does this happen to me of all people? Then your brain will automatically search for the evidence to confirm it. Who here remembers being in an argument with someone for so long that the goal had become lost and it descended into point scoring? <laughs> Who can remember being there? Yeah? The way to get things back on track is to interrupt your own thought pattern with a helpful question like, what am I trying to achieve here? Or, how can I resolve this issue? So, ask an empowering productive question and your brain will instead search for all the relevant tools you have to solve the problem. Moving on to the next link in the chain, meaning. Given what you're focusing on, the brain wishes to discover meaning in what's being observed. The world doesn't make sense to us without a signed interpretation. Meaning meets the human need of certainty that there's some explanation for things. Most of the time, this comes in the form of the subconscious questions, how is this relevant to me and what does it say about where I am and what I'm experiencing? And it's understandable that, through time, that we all too often assign a far more pessimistic meaning to the events we experience. In our evolutionary history, it was actually safer and better to assume the worst. To assume that that rustling in the bushes was a tiger that was going to eat you. Whether you were wrong or right, you still survived. And thus, so did this tendency. The problem is, when we apply this tendency to modern life, things appear beyond our control, too depressing, and thus we feel we can't be expected to change it. Like Hugh Laurie's character, Nix, from the film Tomorrowland, explains about why humanity chose to embrace a future of destruction, because that future doesn't ask anything of you today. So how can meaning be used more intelligently? By assigning far more optimistic and realistic explanations, even to swap out for a negative meaning that we've already assigned. This is known in psychology as reframing. Coming back to the guy from Maidstone, the meaning he gave was that we're all doomed. Whereas the meaning I would give is that these problems require a solution to be sought. 
When you put the data acquired by your focus through the filter of meaning, you then move on to the next link in the chain. Decision. This is the mainspring of what shapes your life. And each of these links are actually decisions as well. To decide is to affect the trajectory of your life. Like a video game that takes a different path depending on the choices you make at certain crucial points, our life stories, even our own bodies, are habitually shaped by our decisions. For instance, consistently deciding to eat healthily is going to positively affect your body and brain, and vice versa. Your decided action sets new causality into motion, and it forms the beaten paths of your behaviour. Repeat a decision often enough, and you create a new norm based on that, that your brain will recognise as change. You will realise that that is you now, a person who behaves and is differently than before. Coming back to the guy from Maidstone, the decision he made was to withdraw from society, you can get rid of his TV and perpetually complain about problems. Whereas the decision I made was to get involved with the advocation of solutions. So, the decisions we make need to be the right ones. The ones that provably make progress towards your goals. This is also where the scientific method comes in, to arrive at these decisions. So, to help you move forward, here's a list of five suggested key action points. Arrive at a decision to do something on this list. Number one, place your alarm away from the bed. No snooze. This will both physically force you out of bed to deactivate it, and it will normalize you to starting off your day with action. And so the task is to sustain the premise of that action henceforth. Number two, I will embark on a seven-day positivity challenge. I will embark on a seven-day positivity challenge. What this is, is a practice of spending seven days, or as long as you can sustain it, choosing to respond to life with positive thoughts and reframing any negative thought as a positive. By all accounts, in this culture, you will still have negative thoughts. That's completely understandable. But the idea here is never to dwell on them. Make the commitment to do this. Number three, use anxiety as a signal to take right action. Use anxiety as a signal to take right action. Years ago, I used to get so anxious about street activism that I'd be sat on the bus going into the high street to go on the megaphone, and I'd be sat on the bus and I would, I would have literal stomach pains. I was so uncomfortable about the fact that I was going to do something which opposes the status quo and possibly garners negative attention and possibly physical violence, that my anxiety manifested as physical pain. When you feel anxiety, all that's happening is that your conscious mind recognises that you're entering a moment that matters. Anxiety is not supposed to shut us down. It's supposed to spur us on. So, next time you feel anxiety, try not to, use, try not to allow it to cripple you into inaction, but use it to actually motivate you. Here's a, here's a little reframe. Next time uh, you feel anxiety, feel your, hear yourself saying, my spider sense is tingling. There's a great reframe for you. Number four, perform daily affirmations. Perform daily affirmations. An affirmation is a regularly recited statement of something positive that you already are or on the path towards internalizing. Words, especially when spoken with emphasis and repetition, are a hypnosis. Some people even do these in the bathroom mirror. We can positively affect and fortify our confidence by the recitation of affirmations. The best way, one of the best ways, to believe good things about yourself is to be honest in admitting the best parts of yourself. And number five, take and hold responsibility. Take and hold responsibility. Responsibility merely means the ability to respond. And what kind of responses are you giving out to the world? 
The next time you find yourself emotionally reacting to a situation, take a step back and say to yourself, I am responsible. I am responsible. This prompts a conscious recognition that not only are you responsible for your own input, including how you emotionally react to stimuli, but also the fact that you have the ability and opportunity to affect the world positively. The fact that you will still do that, despite the fact that most people don't, is evidence of your humanity. Spread your humanity to save humanity. And I'll close this presentation with an insight from a young lady who knew starkly the plight of humanity, even through military occupation and targeted genocide. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. So everybody that's motivated to improve this world now, say yes! Yes! So let's do it! Thank you.